Thank you for that. One correction, you didn't give the, um, the subtitle of that ar novel, 36 Arguments for the Existence of God, a Work of Fiction. <laughs> Okay, so I um, I really like the title you guys chose for this uh, conference, Reason for Change. I like the deliberate ambiguity, the kind of semantic gestalt shift that it forces the mind to make. So of course there's understanding reason for change as asserting something to which just about everybody would agree, namely that things aren't perfect the way they are. I think all of us agree with that. I think probably everybody in the world, unless you're a supreme dictator, wants something to change. Well, of course, we all disagree on what the change is we would like to see. But then, and here comes the gestalt shift, you can hear in reason for change the assertion that it's reason, our capacity for rationality, that ought to take precedence. That's the change required. Reason for change then almost sounds like a kind of campaign slogan. You know, vote reason for change. And that's exactly what I'd like to talk to you about today, why we ought to vote reason for change. Um, not just to fix this or that that's wrong with our society, but in the deepest sense possible. We ought to vote reason for change in pursuing the major project we have in being human, which is, to put it simply, our effort to get our bearings. We humans have a great hankering to get our bearings in the widest sense possible. We want to know where are we, what are we, what's in store for us, and what is it that we're supposed to be doing, given what we are and where we are and what's in store for us? I say that our trying to get our bearings in the largest sense possible captures something that's very distinctive about our species, almost as distinctive, no, as distinctive as the language instinct on which it's dependent. Our trying to get our bearings has resulted in science, philosophy, and also religion. There are two kinds of questions, very big questions, that we struggle with in trying to get our bearings in the largest possible sense. There's the question of what is, what kind of universe is this that we find ourselves in? What's its ontological furniture? And the question of what matters? including whether we ourselves matter, which we would all very much like to do, to matter one way or the other. We no sooner discover that we are than we want that which we are to matter. So when we're thinking about what matters, we've usually got the question of whether we personally matter in mind. That matters to us. Both religion and secular reason have their distinctive approaches to the two questions, what is and what matters. They are both in the business of trying to help us get our bearings in the largest sense possible. Let's consider the question first of what is. The religious approach, and here I'm speaking particularly of the Abrahamic monotheistic religions, Judaism and those two recent outgrowths Christianity and Islam. The religious approach takes it as fundamental to answering what is, God is. Now, that God is would be, if true, a really important fact about our universe. God is would be quite the dominating piece of ontological furniture. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, you have no idea how long it took me to pick out the right piece of furniture. <laughs> I, I also considered this. 
you know, that recliner that some guy in your family won't let you get rid of. Disposing of it is just not going to be raised. It's not a question to be raised. And then there was also this one, the Trinity recliner. <laughs> Hours, hours spent on this. <laughs> anyway, God is, is. If it were true, it would change the entire decor of the universe, decorating it with purpose, intention, design, mind. And that, of course, is how religion treats God is. It's a massive piece of furniture that can't be budged. It's not going anywhere. Instead, that piece of furniture is going to determine all the other major decorating choices in ontology. We all know what ontology means, right? Part of philosophy that talks about what is, from the Greek word ontos, being. Everything that harmonizes with God is, is going to be in. So disembodied souls, for sure, disembodied souls, they're definite, yes. They've got to survive the body's death and go before the divine throne or the divine recliner. And needless to say, everything that clashes with God is definitely out. So say the materialist theory of mind that rules out any kind of disembodied essence of personhood, any soul-like stuff uh, that can get its comeuppance at the end of days. The materials theory of mine definitely does not go with the decorating scheme, it's out. Does secular reason make any claims about what is? It does. It makes such claims in the name of science, which is one of reason's two arms. Reason has two arms that work together with each other, and one of them is science. And reason uses that arm to approach the question of what is. Reason, uh, science is reason's interior decorator. Science is the very reasonable approach that we've worked out for letting the universe answer us back when we're getting it wrong, which of course we're very inclined to do. There's nothing simple about the scientific methodology. My, uh, my work in philosophy is actually in philosophy of science. Um, even calling it a methodology, as if there are step-by-step -step rules, is, is misleading. Science makes use of observation, theory, induction, deduction, abduction, which is what philosophers of science call inference to the best explanation. Makes use of intuitions and predictions and experiments, uh, modeling, including computer simulations. Science is not a simple, follow the rules procedure. But the most essential fact about science is that it always leaves open the possibility that we're getting what is wrong, even at the most fundamental level, at the level of our most ingrained intuitions, intuitions about space and time, causality and identity, intuitions so embedded in us that Immanuel Kant thought they were built into the very structure of the mind. Look at this. It says, that's Kant's thinking cap, right? And there it all is, the, the Kantian categories of uh, apperception, realm, space, time. He thought this was really built into our minds. How could we possibly think outside of them? He was wrong. Uh, science, in fact, proved him to be wrong, demonstrating uh, certain theories that force us to think outside of the Kantian structure. Euclidean geometry, for example, forces us to think outside of the Kantian structure. Science is sometimes accused of being arrogant. And it's certainly true that individual scientists have occasionally been known to manifest that trait. But science, the enterprise, is the embodiment of humility. It makes a method out of humility directing its ingenuity to trying to get nature to correct us when we get it wrong. Oh, so you think that simultaneity is absolute. It's intuitively obvious that it doesn't matter from which frame of reference you make your measurements. Well, we'll just see about that. And voila, the theory of relativity. Oh, well, we'll just see about that. Could be taken as the motto of science. 
And it's a model that takes the measure of our own profound fallibility, our profound realization of our profound fallibility. Nothing is immune from uh, revision, not, not even our view of the uniqueness of this universe, right? The multiverse, this is an idea we're uh, playing around with now. Nothing is immune from revision except the very normative standards of rationality that allow us to do science in the first place. Such standards as are implicit in the concepts of evidence, coherence, consistency, simplicity, and also in the presumption that nature is law-like. If we have a well-established theory, one that commands the loyalty of the community of scientists, and that theory makes a prediction that's not borne out, the reaction is never, well, there's just been a little bit of a miracle, you see. It, hap it happens once in a blue moon, one of these violations of the laws of nature. The object was going very fast, well past the speed limit. It violated a Newtonian law. I'm sure it won't happen again. No reason to go back and reconsider Newtonian mechanics. Just think of all the work and then having to rewrite all those textbooks and trying to get them passed by the Texas school board. <laughs> just, let's just leave these laws as written in place. That's not the way scientists deal with it. Nature is lawlike. Uh, if it's telling us we haven't gotten the law right, we go back to the drawing board. Um, the presumption that nature is governed by laws of nature is the one ontological presumption that stays in place just so long as what we are doing is science. Um, it stays there along with the norms of evidence, consistency, coherence. The presumption of the law-likeness of nature is the what is fact, that's the scientific analog to, um, to the, uh, whole, the divine recliner. Nature is uh, law-like, is not budging from the scientific worldview, just as the divine recliner is not budging from the religious worldview. Okay, so that's how religion and reason go about answering the question of what is. With religion holding on to God is and judging all other decorating decisions, how well it goes with that, and reason handing off all the questions of what is to science, with science holding firm to the norms of rationality and to the one what is presumption, which makes thinking scientifically possible. And of course, thinking this way about what is has gotten us rather far. Let's turn now to the questions of what matters, and specifically to the question of whether we, who want to matter so very much, actually do, and if we do, why we do, and what we can do to increase our mattering, if that's possible. Again, both religion and reason have distinct approaches to the mattering question. And here, reason doesn't hand the questions off to science, but primarily to its other arm, although, as I said, they work better, these two arms of reason, when they work together. Working together is always reasonable. But let's first look at the way uh, religion approaches the question of why we matter. And again, I'm going to concentrate on the Abrahamic religions. The metaphysics of monotheism, as it's worked out over the course of the five books of Moses, is neither consistent nor unequivocal. Its ambiguities and inconsistencies left room for the emergence of the other Abrahamic religions with their sectarian variations that have caused not peace on earth, but bloody havoc. But one thing that the metaphysics of monotheism does offer is a definitive answer to the question of why human life matters. It comes on really strong on that one, and that I think is its great appeal. Uh, humans matter 
because they matter to God, having been made in his image. B'Tselem o Elohim in Hebrew, in the image of God. This phrase, B'Tselem Elohim, is used three times in Genesis, all of them in what have come to be called the priestly portions of the Torah, usually dated to the 6th or 5th century BCE, which means relatively late uh, in, in the writing of the Torah. It's in the last of the three passages of its appearance in Genesis, in chapter 9, verse 6, that the vast ethical dimension entailed in the phrase is revealed. <clears throat> As, excuse me, as the King James Version translates it, Whoso, uh, whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. God's image being impressed into man's substance transmutes that substance into something that matters, so that the shedding of the blood matters. What's more, one can increase one's mattering by procuring the favor of God, living as your particular version of the Abrahamic religion prescribes. Though, of course, they all prescribe somewhat differently, differences that they tend to be very touchy about. I mean, a lot is at stake here. There is all of cosmic mattering to be won. But ignoring the questions, what the Abrahamic religions contend is that we matter big time, cosmically, because we matter to God, who pays an inordinate amount of attention to us, expending at least some of his very famous infinity uh, in attending to every one of our actions. He appears to take us almost as seriously as we take us, which is, which is gratifying. I was brought up in a very religious household and made to feel that everything I did mattered so much to God Almighty that my slightest transgressions, for example, taking a nibble from a particular kind of pastry that I yearned for as a child, but one which lacked the proper rabbinical imprimatur, whoops, Oh, that was, that was being made in God's image. Forgot to show you that. We're B'Selem Elohim, made in God's image, okay. But let's get to the important thing. <laughs> oh, oh, did I want that. No, no, it wasn't allowed to have it. God was watching. The Lord of the hosts minded if I nibbled a hostess Twinkie. This was definitely, I believe this, <laughs> this was definitely terrifying, but you didn't doubt for a moment that you mattered, cosmically mattered. Nothing about you was insignificant. I, I mean a Twinkie, right? It's hard to give up that kind of mattering. Of course, this approach to the mattering question does have the consequence of some of us mattering more than others, either because we're born into a chosen tribe or because we've come to accept the one true faith. God is, God is, so we do matter, but some of us definitely matter more than others. So saith the divine recliner. Well, this makes people do, as we know, all manner of atrocious things to another. I actually went online to get a picture and the pictures which are current and contemporary about the atrocious things people are doing uh, because they know who matters and who doesn't are too contemporary and too horrible. Um, so we're going to stay with the Twinkie. Variations on the answer to the question of human mattering expressed in the conditional. If God is, then human life matters, has so dominated the questions of human mattering in the millennia since those Hebrew tribes put it forth that it seems obvious to people that the following condition is, is just as valid, is equivalent to it. In fact, yeah, that is equivalent to it. If God isn't, then human life doesn't matter. Um, this, this doesn't follow. This is an invalid in inference. Uh, 
If P, then Q doesn't entail, if not P, then not Q. Elementary logic, right? In fact, seeing that, uh, thinking that that is the case is what we call the, um, the fallacy of denying the antecedent. But because if God isn't, then human life matters, is taken to be equivalent to that be the first one, which is true. If God is, then human life would matter in the way that uh, these religions lay out. Um, if that second conditional were true, uh, human life didn't matter, then it's a, it's a moral free for all. We're free to do whatever you can get away with, steal, cheat, rape, murder, go for it. Um, and, uh, but, but of course, this is the uh, fallacy of the uh, denying the antecedent. All those charges that are always being flung at us, that atheism leads straight to immorality, that if God is dead, then all is permissible, blah, 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 blah. It's all so much blather coming from the fallacy of denying the antecedent. As a matter of fact, right around the same time that the Hebrews were working out the approach to the matter in question, another Mediterranean people, right across the Mediterranean Sea for them, was pursuing an entirely different approach, one in which our mattering had nothing to do with supernatural interior decoration. They had gods, they had plenty of them, but interestingly, they kept their gods entirely out of the mattering question. They viewed the mattering question strictly in human terms. It was a mortal question that didn't involve the immortals for them. The gods couldn't do anything to help us achieve mattering. We can do it, we have to do it, for ourselves. I'm talking, of course, about the Greeks. Unlike the Hebrews, they never looked to the attention of their gods to confer mattering on them. They were just as obsessed with this question of human mattering as the Greeks and as uh, many peoples uh, during that period, China, India, Persia. Uh, Greeks too, but for the Greeks, it didn't rest on anything to do with their gods. In fact, the attention of the gods was the very last thing that they ever wanted. Something terrible always happened when a god paid you too much attention. <laughs> Have you been to a museum of Western art recently? Right? Here's the Rape of Europa, the Rape of Ganymede by Rubens, the Rape of the Daughters of Lucipus by Ruben, the Rape of Persephone by Bernini. These are all gods, right? These are gods paying too much attention. Uh, Jupiter and Eo, you can't really see it. It's really scary. Uh, uh, Jupiter, Zeus is very scary there. Apollo and Daphne. And here's one, one of my favorite paintings of all time by Titian, uh, The Flaying of Marcius by Apollo. There's, there's Apollo very conscientiously, studiously ripping the skin off of uh, of Marcius for daring to challenge him to a flute playing contest. Little dog over there lapping up the blood. Um, when it came to the questions of whether we matter and what we can do to make ourselves matter, the Greeks answered in human terms, keeping their terrible gods out of it. I mean, would you want to bring, here's one last one, would you want to bring these gods into it? Right, and that's, that's scary stuff. I certainly don't want to suggest that the ancient Greeks were a race of philosophers. There's never been a race of philosophers. <laughs> Philosophy is hard. Uh, there's this ridiculous myth that the Athenians valued reason above all else. Right. That's why they sentenced Socrates to death, for trying to get them to reason their way toward greater coherence on these questions of what matters. What is true, however, is that their approach, their secular approach to the questions of mattering created the preconditions for philosophy. The society that sentenced Socrates to death believed that what we must do in order to achieve a life of mattering was something extraordinary, enough to attract attention, not of the gods, but rather of other men something that would win one acclaim, fame, what they called kleos, which is an ancient Homeric term 
that stems from the phrase, I hear, and came to mean a kind of auditory renown, having your name on many people's lips. I dubbed this in my last book, later at the Google, Googleplex, The Ethos of the Extraordinary. And it wasn't particularly philosophical, and it wasn't particularly moral. Live so that others will hear of you. The story of you replicated in other minds, as many minds and for as long as possible. And in this way, you can achieve a kind of moreness, a kind of mattering. Do something larger than life so that the story of you will be told by the poets. Poetry was their form of social media. They didn't have Twitter, they didn't have Facebook, they had poets, right? Uh, Pinder, the greatest lyrical poet of ancient Greece, wrote his Epicenian uh, odes, his victory songs, for all the athletic winners of the various Panhellenic athletic events. The Olympics was one, they had three others. Um, the winners or their families would hire him. And here's an ode he wrote for a wrestler uh, who won in five, four, no, sorry, 478 BCE in the Corinthian games. He was a wrestler named Philocrates. And two things only, 10 life's sweetest moments. When in the flower of wealth, a man enjoys both triumph and good fame. Seek not to become Zeus, all is yours if the allotments of these two gifts has fallen to you. Mortal thoughts befit a mortal man. It's all right there in this ode. There's the ethos of the extraordinary. It's secular viewpoint. Mortal thoughts befit a mortal man. It's addressing itself to the question of how we can achieve mattering and answering in terms of triumph achieving the extraordinary because of that fame that it will get you, the moreness to your life. All is yours if the allotment of these two gifts has fallen to you. The ethos of the extraordinary wasn't particularly philosophical and it wasn't particularly moral. Uh, in fact, the ancient Greeks could be pitiless even with one another, just read Thucydides' account of the Peloponnesian Wars. But the ethos of the extraordinary did produce extraordinary achievements. Under its influence, the Greeks went from illiteracy to Aeschylus and Aristotle in a matter of 200 years. They created science, philosophy, abstract mathematics, the study of history, democracy, timeless poetry, drama, architecture, sculpture. The ethos of the extraordinary gets results, not necessarily moral results. Greek philosophy in the persons of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle attacks certain aspects of the Greek ethos of the extraordinary, though not all of it. Here's what they didn't attack. They didn't attack its secular approach to the questions of mattering. They didn't attack the presumption <coughs> that we were not born into mattering, but have to achieve it. And they didn't attack the presumption that we have to achieve our mattering by making of ourselves something extraordinary. But what they did attack was the idea that any kind of extraordinary would do, just so long as it got you attention, that you would be spoken about so that your existence would take on this moreness, uh, the moreness of being replicated in many other points of view. That's not the kind of extraordinary that matters, Socrates and the rest of them argued. Being replicated in many points of view doesn't add up to a hill of beans. Why should being replicated in many points of view confer mattering if these points of view don't matter in themselves any more than your own point of view does? They switched the focus from mere replication of points of view, being known, being famous, having a large Twitter following, uh, to internal qualities of points of view. That's where the right kind of extraordinary is to be found, in the perfecting of the internal qualities of one's own point of view. And then you see you're really not dependent on others knowing about you at all. That's not where your mattering is coming from, not 
the gods in the heaven or your fellow creatures on earth. They don't have to approve of you at all. They can so disapprove of you that instead of liking you on Facebook, they give you a great big cup of hemlock, which is what happened to Socrates. What we have to do is make errors a point of view that values knowledge, they said, that struggles after knowledge, realizing how remote the truth is, how it doesn't lie among the common opinions of one's community, staring at shadows flitting on the back wall of the caves, but rather it must be arduously gone after with rigor and training and dedication and discipline and in collaboration with other knowledge seekers because it's too vast a job for any one of us. We need fellow knowledge seekers to show us the blind spots in our own thinking. Plato, let's remember, created the academy and he gathered all of the best thinkers from all over the Greek world, especially the mathematicians, there to collaborate together. Let no one enter here in who has not studied geometry was supposedly written over the, the gateway to the academy. But it's not enough to try to turn your point of view into a knowledgeable one. We also need to make our points of view just. And pursuing justice in one's point of view also requires training and discipline and dedication and collaboration with others. Since our points of view are riddled with moral contradictions, most of them self-serving, so they keep themselves concealed from the self. That's what Socrates was always doing, wandering around the agora and trying to catch his fellow citizens in contradictions. And so reason was put to work to try to uncover these inconsistencies. And this has been a long and laborious process. But it has been a process that has made cumulative progress. It's been a long, hard, and tragically slow slog through reasoned arguments, which have gotten us to see our moral inconsistencies in making claims on behalf of our own mattering that we don't want to universalize to others, to people of other ethnicities or nationalities or classes or belief system, systems, to the enslaved, the indentured, the colonialized, the impoverished, to women, to children, to gays and lesbians, to transgenders, and to future generations whose lives are going to matter to them just as much as our lives matter to us. So we ought to stop making our planet uninhabitable for them. Reason put to work on the questions of mattering has, unlike religion, argued in the direction slowly, way too slowly, we're still fighting it out, but it's argued in the direction of equal distribution of mattering. Because, let's face it, if you're committed to your own mattering, and really, who isn't, how can you reasonably deny just exactly that same mattering to others. Only prejudice blocks the way, and prejudice is one of the main designated targets of reason. Okay, so in summary, both religion and reason have their definitive approaches to our distinctively human project of trying to get our bearings in a very large sense which boils down to the questions of what is and what matters. The two arms of reason, what used to be called on the one hand natural philosophy, which is now called science, and on the other moral philosophy, on the other have made progress because it's in the nature of reason, self-critical reason to make progress. Reason is never static. It seeks out inner inconsistencies. It seeks out new data. And it's constantly testing its conclusions, giving up its previous viewpoints in the goal of greater inclusiveness, both in taking in the physical universe and the moral nature of ourselves and one another. It holds fast only to the presumptions that reason absolutely requires in order to do its work of expansion on our points of view. And the progress is achieved over the course of the centuries in expanding our points of view, both scientifically 
and morally confers strong justification on those presumptions, backwards justification, that religion just can't claim. So yes, reason for change. And I want to end with an incantation, even though that might not seem so reasonable. But why shouldn't we get to be inspired, reasonably inspired, by reason itself? So here is an incantation uh, by uh, Milos. It's translated by uh, Pinsky. Human reason is beautiful and invincible. No bars, no barbed wire, no pulping of books, no sentence of banishment can prevail against it. It establishes the universal ideas in language and guides our hand so we write truth and justice with capital letters, lie and oppression with small. It puts what should be above things as they are, is an enemy of despair and a friend of hope. It does not know Jew from Greek or slave from master, giving us the estate of the world to manage. It saves austere and transparent phrases from the filthy discord of tortured words. It says that everything is new under the sun, opens the congealed fist of the past. Beautiful and very young are philosophia and poetry her ally in the service of the good. As late as yesterday, nature celebrated their birth. The news was brought to the mountains by a unicorn and an echo. Their friendship will be glorious. Their time has no limit. Their enemies have delivered themselves to destruction. Thank you.